Hello friends, if you're new here, my name is Malki Asad, a plastic surgeon in the US, and in this video, I will answer the questions that you asked me on my Instagram Q&A. The first question is, I'm from Brazil, is it possible to do a research with a mentor from the USA? And the answer is yes, you can do research with someone in the US if you're in Brazil. However, you're very limited in the number of uh, research projects you can work on. Because if you're in a different country than the US, it's hard to send you actual patient information because of HIPAA and that might have ramifications on the hospital. So that's why most people who do online uh, mentoring for research, they participate in case reports or in uh, literature reviews or systematic reviews that do not require actual patient information because again of the limitation of sharing the information with someone outside the institution. In my opinion, these opportunities are really helpful because they can help establish your connections with people in the US, help you improve your English, improve your research skills, but it's always best to do it in the US because you would have more opportunities to work on. Now going to the next question, by the way, if you're wondering about the color of my iPhone, it's yellow. This is my favorite color for the phone. Uh, just want to say hello, I'm at Hopkins for my research fellowship. Gonna meet Dr. Anim. Uh, that's awesome, Dr. Anim is a general surgery resident at Hopkins and we did a YouTube video with her on how to get surgical residency in the US. So go ahead and check out that video on my YouTube channel. The third question is, how to find good research positions in the US? And the answer to this question is very long. That's why I made a whole tutorial that is over three hours to discuss that. So go ahead and check out that tutorial on how to find research positions in the US, how to identify the best mentors, the best institutions, and I'll leave the link for that in the cards above and in the description below. Going to the next question, I'm an African IMG, Ghana to be specific, please guide me in my USMLE journey. We have multiple plans on our website, thematchguide.com, to guide different residency applicants with their USMLE journey. So if you wanna have a residency advising session or USMLE tutoring session, go ahead and schedule that on our website. The next question is, which is the best before the match? Step three, observership or research? And this is actually a great question because I get asked about that a lot from students who have limited time, maybe two, three months before they can actually go and apply to the match. And in my opinion, if I had to pick two of these three, I would pick the research and observership because step three doesn't generally increase your chances significantly. I have some students who have scored very poorly on the step one and step two CK and they take step three as an opportunity to improve their score and say okay I scored much higher so if you're in that situation that might be helpful but the thing is you can't guarantee a high score on the step three so you might score not very good on the step one step two and do step three and also not score very high so it's a risk that you take while on the other hand if you do observerships if you do research you establish connections with the people and these connections might help you more than doing step three. So if I had to pick two between the three, I'll probably pick research or observership. But if you're in a situation where you scored very low on the step one, step two CK, and you wanna take some exams to improve those scores, you might consider step three. Now the question, is it observership or research? Uh, this is a very tricky question. The thing is you can actually do observership if you're in research. Because if you're in research, generally it's not one month or two months, it's generally six months or a year. So if you start in June now and do it until July of next year where residency start, when residency starts, you can actually do some observerships during this research time. Because you can ask your mentor for a month off because most uh, research positions to start with are unpaid and your mentor might not mind you going for a month to do uh, some clinical experience. You might actually do it in the same hospital you're at. You might ask your mentor to shadow them in the clinic or in the OR and that would count as an observership or as a US clinical experience. So research in my opinion is a bigger umbrella. The other advantage of doing research versus observership is that it's now very, very challenging to find free observerships. So most observership you have to pay maybe two or three thousand dollars to get that. Most research on the other hand is generally free. So they don't pay you, but you don't also pay to get the position. Some people are lucky or they have amazing experiences and they actually get paid uh, to do research. But most uh, students who don't have any prior research experience end up with unpaid research positions. Also remember doing research adds bulk to your CV of research experience, of connections, letters of recommendations. So in my opinion, it's tricky, but if you have time and you have the financial situation to support you staying in the US for a year without being paid, in my opinion, research might be more helpful. But this decision has to be individualized based on each single situation. Because if you don't have any prior US clinical experience and you only have two months, 
it might not be advisable to do research. You might do observership. If you have uh, prior research experience and you have done, you have multiple papers and now the only gap is US clinical experience, that might be the best. So the answer to this question should be individualized based on each single situation. And if you want to discuss that with me or in one one advising session with a tutor, go ahead and schedule that on our website through the residency advising and we will give you a detailed answer to your question. Now we have a message in Arabic. Shukran ala kulshi bitsaad fi tullah bi kul anha al-alam mumtanin la khadratak which means thank you for all you're doing, you're doing to the students around the world and I thank you so much. I'm very glad that I'm able to help students around the world. Uh, what are the trusted websites on Google for research in the US? So there are no trusted websites to find research positions. You have to go and find the different institutions, different mentors, and that's what I discussed in my course on how to find research positions in the US. So I'll leave again the links for that in the cards above and in the description below. And if you want, uh, a course to teach you how to do research. I actually have a detailed course that have been taken by hundreds of students and they've been extremely satisfied with it. And all our courses, by the way, this one and the one how to find research positions are all 100% refundable if you're not satisfied. So if you didn't like the course, we'll give you your money back, no questions asked. So if I read first aid only, can I pass tip one? And the, this is a tricky question because I don't know your prior medical knowledge. If you're someone who is really good to start with and have studied extremely well in their school prior to reading first aid, you might be able to pass. But if you're just reading first aid on its own, it might not be enough. What most students don't know about first aid is that it's a review book. So it doesn't cover the information in detail. It's more like these are the most important things. So you have to have understood these concepts from before. One way of you knowing whether you should pass or not is do an assessment tool and see is your score much higher than the passing score or not. And I have a detailed video on how uh, to study for the step one after it becomes pass fail on my YouTube channel. Next is can I match into ophthalmology residency as an IMG? And the answer is yes, you can match, but you have to do hard work. You have to show that you are competitive enough to match in ophthalmology, in neurosurgery, plastic surgery, or any competitive residency in the US. So if the answer is yes or no, yes, you can match. Does everyone match? No, it's, it's very difficult, but it's possible. Will the spots for elective still be open in August? In my opinion, this is very unlikely. Now we are in June at the time of recording this video that spots will be open in August only two months apart because usually the spots for electives are filled months ahead. So if you're considering doing electives, make sure to apply months ahead and look at the application deadline because every institution has a different deadline and most of them have at least three months. There is a question I didn't understand fully. Can first year medical students from India join the course? Uh, they just took the admission before one month. Uh, I'm not sure if you're referring to one of my courses or you're referring to something else. If you're talking about our courses, all our courses, you can sign up and take them at any time. So you don't have to have much prior knowledge about the topic to be able to sign or understand the course. And as I said, all the courses are 100% refundable. So if you sign up and you don't like it, we'll give you your money back. And if you were asking whether you can buy it now and activate it later, yes. So you can buy the course now and activate it after two or three months if this is what you're asking for. Now, next question is, bro, is there a way to get B1, B2 visa for electives in six months only? I got ACC in FIU in January. So again, I'm not sure what these abbreviations stand for, but if you're asking whether you can get the B1, B2 visa to get an elective in a six month period, it depends on your country and how much is the wait time for your country. I know that some countries have a very long wait time now to apply for the visa. Uh, other countries don't have that long time. So it depends on the country if you're asking whether you can get the visa within six months period. But if you're asking whether your visa could be uh, for six months, generally the US visas are long, like in years. It depends on the country. You can check on the, I think the USCIS website, how long does the individuals from your country get the visa for, but you get admission generally for six months. So you can do electives on a B1, B2 for six months. Uh, if you need to stay for longer, you either have to leave and come back or do certain procedures. I would recommend talking to a lawyer to discuss that in detail. The best possible way to learn about our statistical program. So I cover in detail how to do statistical analysis and I have examples in my course on how to do statistical analysis for research projects, but I don't cover R. The programs covered in the course are JMP and SPSS. So if you're looking for R specifically, look for other available resources online. But if you're just asking to learn how to do statistical analysis for research projects, I highly recommend starting with a program that is simpler than R. 
So the ones I cover are JMP and SPSS. They are very user friendly and I highly recommend you start with these. How did you get uh, into research at Mayo Clinic and do they sponsor visas for IMGs? How did I get? I emailed the physician that I wanted to work with and we met online, had multiple interviews, we started the paperwork and then I got the position. And yes, they do sponsor visas for IMGs. If I want to start with the research job for getting surgery residency, should I give USMLE before getting that job or during that research job? So should you do the USMLE during your research or before that? In my opinion, especially if you want to be productive in your research time, I recommend you finish the USMLE exams before. So when you start your research, you're fully dedicated to research. You don't have another stress. You don't have uh, something that is taking the majority of your time. So if you have time and you have some like time to before you start your research time, I highly recommend you do your exams before. Please throw light on ECFMG pathways and certification process. It's expiry link to EOT. So I actually have a detailed video on the ECFMG pathways and certification on my YouTube channel. So go ahead and check that out. I'm very scared to start this tough journey. What do you suggest? It's indeed a tough journey. It's very long, it's tiring, but it's very rewarding. So what do I suggest? I recommend you start educating yourself about the process. Uh, find out if this is the right place for you. And I recorded the video on why should you consider doing residency in the US. So watch this video and see is what I'm talking about as a system, as a structure aligns with what you're looking for in the residency program. Is the US the country that you want to do your residency in? If the answer is yes, start by learning about the process. Start early. This is why I recommend it. the earlier you start, the easier it becomes, the higher chances you have at matching in residency in the US. So educate yourself about the process. Be sure that this is where you want to do your residency and start early and prepare early. How do we look and apply for research positions? As I discussed before, I have a detailed course about that and I'll leave the link for that in the description below. How to come up with a topic for a systematic review or review? So this is very tricky and I discussed that in my research course uh, from idea to publication and I have a detailed lesson on how to come up with idea. But generally, especially if you're starting new, you take ideas from your mentors. So your mentors give you the idea and you start working on it. As you learn more about research, you write papers, you start finding ideas that you can write about. So generally to start with for beginners, it's their mentor's idea and as they read and learn more about the topic, it becomes their ideas. Difference between a research fellow versus assistant versus associate, which to apply with less uh, experience. So I discussed that in my course on how to find research positions and differences between these. But to answer your question simply, there is not much difference. The difference is more in the title, which might reflect in the salary. So the tasks totally depend on your mentor. But if you want a more detailed discussion of that, go ahead and let, check out our course on how to find research positions in the US. Chances of matching into surgical specialties with low scores. Definitely having low scores decreases somebody's chances of matching. There is a curve uh, that you can look at on the NRMP data and the higher score, the higher chances of matching. Why? Because different programs use the USMLE scores as a screening tool. So if you have higher scores, you're more likely to pass these screening tools. Does that mean that if you don't score high, you're not going to match? No. You have less chance, but you still can match. I've seen numerous instances of people matching with low scores, but you have to work on other parts of your CV. Maybe your research, your communication skills, your clinical skills, and you have to show it to someone in the US. You might have all these from another country, but you have to convince people in the US that you are fit for a residency spot in surgery. Did you do research while you were in med school in your country? No, I did not do much research when I was in my country. When I started my research time at the Mayo Clinic, I only had one case report that I wrote while I was doing a rot rotation in the US. So not having research experience before doesn't mean you can't start research, doesn't mean you can be great at doing research. Is it important in what journal your paper gets published? And is a retrospective study considered valid? Yes, definitely a retrospective study is considered valid. Most studies in the literature are retrospective studies. So the more advanced you become, you start doing prospective studies of randomized clinical trials. But if you're just starting, retrospective studies are great study designs. Case reports are not as important, but they still, if you're starting, it's not bad to start with a case report. But as you advance, you should start going towards more case series, larger case series, maybe national databases, systematic reviews, retrospective studies, and the next step would be prospective studies and randomized clinical trials. And to answer the first part, is it important what journal your paper gets published in? Yes, it's definitely important. Because people reading your CV, 
they would look at what journal the paper got published in. And if it's a journal they recognize, highly respected within the field, they will give more attention to your CV. Does that mean that all program directors do that? No, some program directors just look at numbers. Some people look in the details of the paper. So it varies a lot, but definitely having a better journal to, in which you publish the paper gives you uh, more advantage. Hardest to assembly exam in your opinion? In my opinion, studying for step one was harder than studying for step two, but the exam of step two was harder. So during the exam, I felt more stressed uh, in the step 2 CK compared to step 1 because step 1 if you know the information you answer the question but step 2 you know the information you know that these two options work but you need the one that works better or the, the answer that is the best or the most likely or the first option so that was very stressful in the exam and the questions were longer so as, a, as an exam itself step 2 CK was the harder exam but to prepare for the exam step 1 by, by far was the hardest exam I studied for how do I get in contact with doctors who provide clerkships without these websites in between? And this is very challenging. And I was talking to a student about that yesterday because when you're doing research, you're providing value to the person you're working with. So you'll be working with them for six months a year doing research for them. So it makes sense for them to have you there for free and actually teach you how to do research because they will teach you for a month or two and then you will be doing things on your own. But the problem with clinical experience is that the doctor will not be getting anything from you. It's full liability. So you might do, do a mistake in the hospital and that would affect the doctor that brought you there. So unless you have some type of connections, it's very challenging to have someone sponsor you for free uh, without prior knowledge or without these websites. So if you ask someone who you know, your parents know, or friend of a friend, or maybe from the same country, from the same school, they are likely to respond to you, but if there are zero connections, it's unlikely and you might need to work through the website. But that doesn't mean you can't find positions like that, to try and email different doctors and you might have someone to respond to you. But again, it's unlikely, but not impossible. And now going to our last question, how possible is it to get research positions while still in my home country? If you, if you mean finding a research position so you can come to the US, I think we already covered that. You can check out uh, the course I have on how to find research positions in the US. But if you mean do research in your country with someone in the US, that was one of the first questions we answered. You can email them, try to see if they need any help with uh, statistical analysis or writing a paper, but you need to provide them with some skills. So it's unlikely for someone to respond to uh, someone who they don't know uh, without them having any experience. So if you have some experience to prove to them that you can be valuable, such as I did analysis for multiple papers and I can help you with that, that might convince them to do research with you. Another way is some people actually post online on LinkedIn, on Instagram, Twitter, all these platforms. They post that they need somebody to help them with the research project. So look for these opportunities. These would generally be from younger people like residents, fellows, people in their early career. But it's unlikely to find a professor posting online that they need help with research project because they already have so many students and residents who can help them with that. So that brings us to the end of this video. I hope the answers to these questions cover many topics that you might not have asked but you were wondering about. If you have any questions that were not covered in this uh, Q&A, we'll do multiple Q&As in the future that you can ask your questions or you can drop them in the comments below and I'll make sure to answer as many as I can. If you like this video, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell sign so you get notified whenever I post future videos on my YouTube channel. Thank you everyone so much for watching and see you in future videos. Peace.